some of you know me. I've been using D since around 2009. I've been a compiler contributor since roughly the middle of 2011. Um, worked on lots of stuff. And recently, I've been working on converting the front end of the D compiler to D, finally. This is something that's come up over and over over the years. Everyone's wanted to write the compiler code in D, but the burden of switching over has been too high. So, okay, there's a lot of stuff in this talk. I'm probably going to run out of time, so I'll try and go fast. <laughs> um, one thing Walter said last night is that he's posted enough things on the forum that you can find him saying pretty much anything. So here we go, here's a quote from Walter. This is why we actually want to do this. And some people have been a little, people have said all sorts of different reasons, but what Walter said here is, is spot on. The point is not to use the compiler to stress test the language, not at all. The point is to improve the compiler by taking advantage of what D offers. So this is pretty much everyone's motivation of switching any project to D. They want to be able to write nice, clean, simple D code. They want it to be easy to refactor, easy to check safety. And you really don't get that with C++. So hopefully, when the conversion is complete, we will be able to avoid all of those time-wasting issues that you have with C++. Okay, now, the problem is the compiler front end is fairly big. <laughs> So at the moment, it's around about 120,000 lines. Um, it's also a moving target. So we're getting about average, roughly, 20 pull requests a week for the compiler, which is about three a day. And they're getting merged at about that same rate. So there's quite a lot of churn in there, and that's a problem for some, some methods of trying to convert it to D. So the other problem is, because it's such a big task and it takes so much time to actually do a conversion on such a big code base, there are going to be problems. There are, you're going to find back-end code gen bugs and API compatibility issues. These are going to come up when you're targeting you know, eight different platforms. And if we, most ways of doing this would require stopping development and Stopping development for an unknown amount of time because you can't account for all the things that might go wrong is a fairly big problem. Okay, so a couple of the common things that have been tried in the past and are currently being tried now, some of these, and n none of this has ever produced a replacement for the compiler. So first one is putting everything by hand. So this is, this is quite easy, everyone, well, most people yeah, probably no C++ and D, and the, doing the mechanical translation is not particularly difficult. But it's huge. Doing it by hand requires stopping work on parts of the compiler while they're being converted. There is a certain amount of refactoring that you have to do because some things are not expressible in D. And if you're doing that, there is a huge urge to put in other changes there and make things simpler. And the more of that you do, the more likely you are to introduce bugs and set yourself back and make it take even longer. So this has been attempted. Uh, there are several, re uh, autom uh, not automatic, hand ports of parts of the front end, but it's never been completed to the point where we could switch over and ditch the C++ version. So another option that some people favor is just chucking out the compiler and starting from scratch. And on one hand, this is nice because you don't need to stop development on the main compiler because you don't care anymore. You can just get rid of it when that's ready. And one thing that's actually, one very positive thing that's come out of this is, because there are several rewrites, especially at the Lexer and Parser, it's tracking down all the bugs in the spec, all the things that DMD does its, its own thing for some reason. And yeah, so we, we've got, we've had massive improvements, especially in the language grammar over the last couple of years to the point where it's, I think, nearly trustworthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you do, on the other hand, throw out all of the work that's been done over the years at fixing bugs and implementing complicated features. And again, the compiler is big and some of that is complexity that is just 
historical, but a lot of that is because there are a lot of features and implementing it is is complicated and you end up with a lot of code no matter what. So at the moment SGC is um, being developed using this method. I don't know if there's any end in sight. How close? We are like, so most of the basics are like pretty solid. Yeah. yeah, so uh, most of the basics are pretty solid at this point in SDC, but there is a ton of, of um, like many small stuff to bash. Um, like, like, yeah, many, 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 many small features that are not that difficult to implement, but that just need to be there to for for everything to work. So um, that's probably at least at least a year or two before this is uh, anywhere near production quality. Oh, and that's assuming that DMD doesn't get any more crazy features. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, competition is good. Other alternatives mean we are actually checking all those weird corner cases and we're finding them, we're documenting them. And some of that's done by having the alternative backends, with GDC and LDC, but not everything because they're still sharing the front end, they still get the same front end bugs. Um, okay, so this is, it, SGC has been worked on for five years, maybe more, something like that. Yeah, but, and maybe a couple more years it'll be finished, but I wanted to do something faster, so <laughs> instead automatically convert the source. Now this comes out really nice because not only are you not throwing away all the old work, but you don't have to stop development on the main compiler. So when you're ready, when the generated source is as good as the original C++ source, which it nearly is, we'll be able to switch over and abandon the C++ source in one go. So development has kept on going all the way up until now, well, it's still going. We're still getting the roughly three pull requests a day. No interruption. So I, I tried a, this is an unsuccessful way I tried to do the automated conversion, which is just doing it at the token level. So first tokenize the source after pre-processing. So when you're hand porting, you end up looking for little patterns, like one of the really common ones is turning the arrow operator into the dot operator, because D doesn't have a distinction. And doing this by hand is incredibly tedious. So usually you'd automate it somehow with regular expressions, or in this case, by tokenizing the source, and then you can apply this automatically. And it's really easy to do, and it gets you about 95% of the way there. But you're doing it after pre-processing, which means you've lost all except one target platform because of the way the front end is written. Everything is done with, or well, nearly everything is done with pre-processor definitions for the target. Um, and the last 5% is entirely special cases. Thousands and thousands of special cases. So the, the nice pattern matching with just doing it on tokens is, is great. It gets it gets almost everything, but in the huge code base, you've got so much that it doesn't manage to get. And what you end up, what you end up doing is maybe there are two or three places in the code that has to behave differently. And in order to find those and have them apply a different sort of transformation, you end up having to have a huge amount of context, the tokens before it, to try and uniquely identify that one place. And after you've done a few thousand of these, it, it gets out of hand, and I, I gave up. <laughs> um, this is still something useful. Um, if you were doing hand porting, you could run something like this first, and you would get out source code that most of the mechanical changes were already done. So attempt two, which was much more successful, was using a more complicated approach and passing the C++ source properly, rather than just working on tokens. So pass it, do some basic analysis, and adjustments on it, and then write it out as D. So the problems here is C++ is, is horrible to pass. Trying to write a full C++ parser is incredibly difficult. Walter can agree, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sense some past trauma there. <laughs> um, 
the preprocessor is another horrible problem because it's not really part of the language. But we really need to keep all of those preprocessor hash if blocks and turn them into D version blocks to get the same sort of code at the end in D. So change where we're aiming. Don't, don't try and convert all of C++, just accept what DMD uses, which is a fairly nice subset. So we don't have to handle invalid code. We don't have to handle the difficult symbol resolution because we can skim over that by hard coding a list of types because we're only targeting one code base. And yeah, there are still some tricky cases that can't necessarily be done, but you can just hard code them in. Unlike the last approach, which 95% was automatic, this is much closer to 99%, and that 1% is a bit more manageable. So yeah, another thing is not supporting templates except for one type. So there's actually a special case code that if it sees array, it knows it's expecting a template argument after it because that's the one templated type that's used in DMD. Yeah, it's cheating, right? <laughs> so the other way to cheat is change the C++ source. So if there's something that's tricky to pass or tricky to convert, just get rid of it from the original. So we... we <laughs> Turn it into something that works pretty much the same way in D and in C++. And it's, it's, it's easy. <laughs> it works. As long as you have access to the C++ source and you can change it, it's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can use easier, for, easier features. You can get rid of tricky parts. And for some things that can't be converted and can't easily be changed to something else, you can just port it by hand, so long as it's something that doesn't change too often. And a couple of those big ones are the array templated type. Didn't even try to convert that, just wrote a new one in D that had the same interface. And sign extended number, it was, I think it's the only, no, there might be one other case of operator overloading in DMD. And trying to convert it to D's different scheme, it was just not worth the effort for one class. So I and put it in. Okay, here's another Walter quote <laughs> saying, my experience driving in never, ever, ever attempt to refactor while translating. What always happens is you wind up with a mess that just doesn't work. Now, as usual, Walter's right. <laughs> but the rules are different when it's automatic because the hard work of porting is not hard anymore. It is now completely automatic you, you know, run one make file target and 10 seconds later you have all the D source. So if you did get the urge to refactor and you screwed something up, 10 seconds later you know it doesn't work, you throw it out, you do it again. It's 10 seconds of, yeah, it doesn't cost you anything anymore. So this is great because it lets you work on the C++ source and do all sorts of refactoring and not have to worry about screwing up your conversion. So. What's happened is I've made lots and lots and lots of changes to the C++ source for the front end. And it's a, it comes out to about 97% of it can be automatically converted now. And yeah, there are 10 files that I put it by hand for various reasons. So some because one, one because it's got templates, one because of operator overloading, and a few because they use fairly low level things. And some of those, so there are a few that do um, the, the port library in DMD abstracts away differences of the host platform and compiler. And in D, we actually don't have as many differences. And a lot of them are already abstracted away by D runtime. So porting that was made it a lot simpler because it just calls into those methods. OK, so the tool I wrote to do this is called Magic Port. <laughs> and it's a C++ to D source to source compiler. So yeah, the, the level of analysis it does is, is pretty small. It's got a D pretty printer that's pretty good. <laughs> um, and it's about 6,000 lines in total, and it contains some of the worst code I've ever written. I blame C++ for that, because every time I'd, I'd find some new feature and I'd just go, OK, I'll s add a go-to in there. I'm not, I'm not going to restructure the whole passing thing for declarations. It's not, it's not worth it. And it works. 
I don't want to have to go back there and add anything more in there, but <laughs> for this it works, and so that's good enough. <laughs> now, Magic Board is not a silver bullet for converting C++ to D. It, this literally will only work with DMD because it, is, it makes a huge amount of assumptions about the way things work that aren't actually guaranteed by C++. So, yeah, for example, it, it, there are some identifiers for types that it, it will choke if you use them as an identifier for a variable name. And it's, it's just easier that way to always assume that it's, there's no conflict there. And it simplifies parsing. And when you're only targeting one program, it's quite easy to enforce. Um, another one is mul the classic C and C++ when you have multiple variables declared in one declaration. You can have them of different types often by accident. <laughs> um, so I just assumed that none of those existed and I probably removed a couple from the source and it just simplifies everything because then you can easily translate it to a similar D declaration where different types wasn't supported. Um, there are also quite a few hard-coded things that assume certain things work a certain way. So the two, the two ways you use um, hash define are to define a a constant, usually, and those always become manifest constants. So if you're using that to define an alias to a variable or a function, it fails. And the other one is writing a macro, and macros are, in, in the wild in C++, they can do anything. They can you know, behave like mix-ins, they can call functions, they can declare functions, but in DMD, all the macros that are left act pretty much as, as if they were templated functions in D. So it, with that assumption, it's quite easy to just add in template arguments and rewrite it. OK, so magic port first tokenizes the source. Pretty simple. Again, it makes assumptions. Everything's ASCII. Everything's nice. It, it's pretty inefficient, I think. But you know, in the scheme of things, it doesn't matter. For this one project, it's fast enough. Um, there are some hacks in there because of the preprocessor. So it's because I know that there's no places in the source code where the hash and the if def are separated by white space. I can just flex it as one token and that makes passing simpler later. Well, all of these little things add up to make it a more pleasant experience. <laughs> so after it's flexed it and you've got a list of tokens, it scans through looking for some patterns. And these are similar to the the approach that didn't work, it looked for patterns like this. But in this case, we're scanning through and trying to find all the names of the structs and classes. And that works for most of them. For the rest, you hard code. There's a JSON file to configure the, the converter that you just have a list of them. Yeah. Um, OK, and then it passes. The parser is about a quarter of the, the code, magic port. A limited subset, no, no error recovery at all. If you're lucky, it'll assert. If you're unlucky, it'll crash somewhere, somewhere later. <laughs> but because we, we know that the C++ source being fed in is valid already, we don't have to worry about that. Um, it simplifies the AST as it, as it processes it. So those are three forms of accessing a, some kind of member of a scope. But in D, we don't care about the difference. We only have one version. So it doesn't have three different types of AST nodes for that. It just has one, and it just as simple as possible. So the basic analysis it does is it goes through and looks at all of the different AST types and builds lists of them. And this is so later we can go back and we can look for certain things and pull them out, and I'll do that in a minute. Um, it also checks that all of the types that you've manually entered are actually used. And I had to add this in there because I kept on making typos. And if it didn't detect it as a type, it would detect it, it would think it was a variable. And that classic case of A asterisk B not knowing whether it's a multiplier or a variable declaration, it would assume it was a multiplier and you would get some very, very, very strange errors when you tried to run the generated source through the decompiler eventually. Okay, it also removes duplicate type defs, which I, I don't even remember the details, but C++ allows them in situations that D doesn't. 
Okay, it then goes through and merges function declarations. So C++, you generally have the declaration of the function in the header file inside a, uh, for a global function, it's just sitting in the header file or multiple header files. For a member function, it's sitting, it's sitting inside the class definition, which is also inside the header file. And the body is somewhere else. So indeed, we don't have support for that. So it has to go through and use the list that it built before to find, to search through all of the function body definitions and try and match them up with the declaration, the forward declaration it saw earlier. And it's a little bit complicated because you can take the body from the definition of the function, but you have to make sure you take the default arguments from the forward declaration because there is no guarantee they will match. <laughs> And I think there were actually a couple of cases in DMD where it had different arguments. So if you call it from a different file, it might do a different thing. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it made a huge difference. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it was ever actually called with the default argument from within the file, but it's, it's this kind of duplication leads to errors that is nice about D not having. Um, similar thing for the initializers for static member variables. Um, yeah. One of the horrible special cases in here that I, I haven't been able to get rid of is scope has the scope class, which keeps track of you know, all the variables in scope and things like that, it has a default constructor. And of course, in D, there are no default constructors. So most of the cases, all of the member variables could just be initialized to zero or whatever D would already initialize them to. So I could just drop the default constructors. But for scope, I had to do something more complicated. So there's actually code in there. It reads the default constructor, which is entirely composed of assignments to member variables. It takes the values that are being assigned and turns them into initializers in the decode. So again, this is making huge assumptions that none of those are, th that all of those values are constant values. And in this case, it's fine. So. Okay, it, it goes through and it, after that it goes through and it pulls out a whole bunch of dead declarations that we don't actually want in the decode. So includes don't really work the same way, so we have the imports listed separately. Um, version blocks sometimes contain things, things in the rest of the list like extern function prototypes or includes and occasionally they end up empty and we don't want a whole bunch of empty version blocks in our decode, so we strip them out as well. And there's a few more things like we don't need include guards anymore in D. Okay, so then we take all of the top level declarations we found and we shove them into a giant hash map. And we use a fairly simple mangling scheme, which it isn't great, but it's human readable, so <laughs> that's an advantage. And yeah, so it also supports overloaded functions with a more complicated mangling scheme when it has to. So once we've got all these in a nice big map, we're ready to start generating decode. So the config file I mentioned earlier has a huge list of every module that we want to create. And for each module, it has a list of imports. It has a list of all the top-level declarations that go in there, which are the mangled names from the, pr from the previous map. And there's also the option to insert random any decode you want in there, which is quite useful because a few modules need a log variable at the top, like a manifest constant to turn on and off logging. And the converter doesn't support having this, uh, variables with the top level declarations with exactly the same name. So they were stripped out earlier. There's more special cases for that. Okay, so it goes through, pretty prints them. It make sure that all of the declarations in your list actually existed and it makes sure that everything was referenced so you haven't dropped out a couple of functions. And yeah, um, one, of the, one of the horrible, horrible things was getting rid of all the, the if defs that are used like this because if you've got an if def halfway through an expression, how do, how do, you, how do you turn this into D? <laughs> how do you automatically do this? And this is not the worst in there. <laughs> Um, yeah, sometimes it's impossible to pass. It, it, it has been done, you can do it for simple cases, but it's, it's sort of not worth it. So, yeah, cheat. Go through and strip them all out of the C++ source. So there's a, an equivalent piece of code that can be written in D, assuming that that identifier is a manifest constant somewhere. 
And honestly, the C++, C++ code is better off for this. <laughs> okay, comments, similar. We, we really, really need to preserve all the comments. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but sometimes the comments are in very strange places. Um, yeah. <laughs> so most, most of the comments are in nice places where you could have a statement or they're in, they're in, like they're after the closing parenthesis of an if condition or they're before a function. So th those are fine. We can pick those up really easily and we can work out where they're supposed to be and attach them to the nearby declarations if we have to. But some comments are just in the middle of nowhere. That do something comment, the second one, is especially bad because if we pass that as a statement and there was actually code after it, the code after it would be moved outside the if. But yeah, so the easiest way is to detect all of these, go through the C++ source and fix them to something a bit more sensible. Yep. Uh, you still hold the record for largest number of deformat bugs filed in a single day. <laughs> yep, guess how I found those. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, so when deformat was released, or some months after, I took the generated source out of the, out of magic port and I ran it through deformat and then I looked at the diff. And pretty much everywhere that there was a difference, and there were lots of differences, <laughs> was a bug in, in one or the other. So both tools benefited from this. <laughs> um, okay. Once you've done all that, it converts successfully. You've got out decode. It didn't, it didn't crash, it didn't assert at any point, <laughs> finally. But <laughs> it doesn't compile. Of course it doesn't compile. So <laughs> there's all sorts of things that are OK in C++, but, but not OK in D. One of the really annoying ones was local variable shadowing. Um, a lot of the semantic analysis code in DMD, it uses a variable named E for everything. So one function might have uh, four or five variables named E in nested scopes. <laughs> and, yeah, D is not very happy with that. <laughs> um, another one is implicit narrowing for integers. Uh, there are lots of cases, especially in the interpreter, that assume you can convert a, a D integer underscore T, which is a 64-bit integer generally, to a size T. And, of course, that doesn't work on 32-bit in D. So I, I just went through and added casts for all of those. <laughs> I, I didn't fix the bugs. I just, I just made it work in D. That's, that's a problem for another time. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, the pull requests are all still there. But they've got a cast on them now, so they're easier to find. And a similar case was class handles in, well, in C++ they're just pointers, but in D they're a separate type and you have to explicitly cast to get a void pointer. Um, you know, why you're actually getting a void pointer in the first place is a bit, is a bit iffy. <laughs> I think one of the valid uses is putting it into the uh, hash map. Um, one of the less, the less valid cases is because you want to mem copy the contents. <laughs> It works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and one uh, a really annoying one is you can't do implicit struct construction. So lock takes, uh, you could, they had one constructor that took an integer for a line number and you could just call the function passing zero for that argument and it would implicitly construct a location struct. And you can't do that in D. So basically had to go through and add an explicit constructor call at every single place, which, you know, it, it's mechanical, it's fairly easy to do, but it was an enormous change. <laughs> okay, so it still can't compile. <laughs> you need, you, there was a horrible problem where if you passed a string literal to a variadic function like printf, the C++ version would pass a pointer, the D version would pass an array, and you would get you know, a crash, mostly, or some very strange output sometimes. <laughs> and, okay, and D has, well, it does now, it has very strict checking for go to skipping over variable initializations, possibly too strict, but yeah. 
Um, that, that was just meant going and fixing them in C++ source as if that was a real error. The nice, the nice trick for getting the length of an array does not work in D, mostly because the D version of the array variables are now pointers, so the length information is gone. In most cases, I did try to convert them to actual D arrays, but in most cases it's not possible because the implicit conversions are different. So that's something to do after the conversion is finished. Um, okay, I'm going to skip through some of this. More of the same. Um, there are also some things that you just can't do in D, which are a problem. So struct default constructors are a big pain. In, in DMD, it's, it's not too bad because most of them I could just drop. But I've certainly seen other C++ code that uses, uses them a lot more frequently. And I don't know, not having them in D is a, is a big pain. You've actually got to do substantial change to the C++. And now, this is, this is one, of, one of Walter's ones. <laughs> Version is crippled compared to uh, hash if, compared to the processes if, because you can only put a single identifier and you cannot do logical expressions. And basically that just meant I couldn't use it. I had to use static if instead, which is a shame because it's nice having the, the full, the list of possible versions and doing it like that. But anyway, um, there's also one, one other thing you can't, you're missing a way to define data. You can do it in C++ on the command line. You can set a preprocessor symbol, but there's no way to do it in D. Maybe we can add a way to do it. I don't know. <laughs> not not the same as C++, but anyway, yep. String use the mic. I was just uh, say string imports, the problem is it has to be in a file then. So I it's still possible, but it's it's not as convenient. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay, it compiles. You fix all that, it'll compile. But now, you've, now we hit on the C++ interop problems, which is you actually need to make these classes that you've just converted to D accessible to the glue layer, which is still in C++. So I had to add a whole bunch of extensions to D's C++ interop support. So being able to actually define extra C++ classes was a big one, allowing non-virtual functions, allowing member variables, I think static variables as well. I think all we had before were virtual functions, uh, global variables and global functions. But now we've got a lot. So next up, we, you've got this, you've implemented all the C++ features, you try and link it against the glue layer and you get lots of linker errors. And this is because, well, partly there were a lot of mangling bugs in there, in the DMD C++ mangling, which are now mostly fixed. There are some complications with uh, C++'s character types, it has three. Uh, there's the signed one, the unsigned one, and the maybe signed one. <laughs> and, yeah, none of these really correspond directly to D's Unicode 8-bit character. So we defined our own. And because the symbols aren't actually resolved in magic port, it's easy to make it um, map to some other type. Uh, in 64 is not always the same type which means unsigned long in D doesn't always mangle to the same C++ type, which is a, if you look at the list of platforms there, does anyone know what the, the common thing with the unsigned long ones is? Well, they're all the LP64 platforms. So Win64 is the odd 64 one out because it's long is still 32 bits. So that was quite easy. Size D not always being the same, the same type on the same, on the same um, architecture, was a problem. Well, more was more of a problem because for 32-bit architectures it was fine for Windows, Linux, and FreeBSD, but OS X for some reason used unsigned long instead of unsigned id. So we dropped support for OS X 32. <laughs> <laughs> so you can still target it. You just can't build a DDMD for it which is no great loss because it's really a dead platform. <laughs> okay, so it links, but then it crashes. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of this was uh, layout problems, so alignment of fields in classes, especially when you've got inheritance. And this, th these bugs are quite hard to track down. 
but because I've got access to the full AST of the front end, I made it output code in C++ and D that will basically go through and calculate every offset of every member of every struct and check them against each other. And with that, it's trivial to find all the bugs. There are still a couple in there, but they're, they're not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's only a problem if you're actually accessing the same class from the DE side and the C++ side. So it's the lexer and the parser, there's still a bug there, but you never call them from the glue layer, so don't worry about it. Um, there's some problems with some of the calling conventions as well. And I made a simple fuzz test to just try a whole bunch of different functions with a bunch of different arguments and pass values across the language boundary and check that they came back intact, which was quite effective at finding the actual bugs. So, you know, I get a crash on some platform running running DDMD and I, I just go, oh no, I'm not going to even try to reduce this. I'll just run the fuzz tester and it had come up with something pretty quickly. Whether it was the same thing or not was another story. But <laughs> <laughs> um, there, was, there was some quirks with Win32 vtable layout. It, for some reason, if you've got an overload set, it inserts them backwards into the vtable like in reverse order. I don't know why, but it's just Windows being different as usual. And there are a whole bunch of problems with variadic arguments where um, well, it wasn't implemented correctly. There were all sorts of bugs on the 64-bit POSIX platforms, and there were a couple on Win64. Most of those are fixed, not all of them. Um, and related to that VA copy, there's a problem with that because it actually can't... The, the, the VA list type cannot actually be expressed in D because it's a, a, an array of one struct type. So when you put it on the stack, it's meant to allocate space for one struct. But when you pass it to another function, it's passed as a pointer. And D doesn't have a, a type like that, and I gave up trying to trying to get the DMD backend to actually generate code correctly for one like that. So there's a hack in there that makes it work in almost every case now. Um, found a few other backend bugs, just random code gen optimizer bugs. That happens when you're using sort of a different, different subset of D that hasn't really been exercised so much. I guess th there's a lot of pointer code in there that you wouldn't you wouldn't bother writing in D today. You just write, you know, a for each loop. So that that's not th they're hard to fix, but there wasn't so many bugs. And depending on what code you're porting, you might find a lot or you might find none. Um, there are still a few code generation issues that haven't been fixed. They're just worked around because I don't know how to fix them. But there are some cases where the way DMD returns floating point numbers on Win32 is different to how uh, DMC returns them. I'm not sure why. Um, yeah, there's still a few bugs on POSIX64 for struct passing, but not, not with any of the structs that DMD uses. So, <laughs> And you can't do constructor and destructor calls across the language boundary. So you can new a class that's been written in D and X to C++, you can new it from the D side, but you can't new it from the C++ side because it doesn't generate a constructor right. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of extra complications that we'd have to add because we'd have to do class initialization the way C++ does it, which D's way is better. So it's not too much of a problem. You just have a wrapper function if you really need to construct a class from the glue layer. Uh, there's a, a few other problems like this is once once you've got the generated source, these are purely cosmetic. Everything works even without fixing these. One of them is D not supporting defining functions. So what DMD does is for compiler passes like, um, I don't know, C++ mangling that has a pass that can go through all the types and do things. Originally, it would add a virtual member function to each of the classes, each of the type classes in the AST to do a sort of visitor implementation. And that's fine in C++ because you can have all those functions together in a separate file away from the class, the rest of the class functions, but in D you can't. So to keep it sort of the same code layout, we moved a everything to a proper visitor implementation so they could all be grouped together. And that had the nice side effect. Um, you can use the you can add a new visit class without changing the class definitions and the headers, which is quite quite nice if you're 
working on LDC or GDC and you need to add something and you don't want to have to go and change DMD and try and upstream the patch. With, there's still some problems there because you still need to change it to add member variables, but we'll work something out there. Okay, um, there's a few formatting issues. Um, deformat, it, I don't like what it does either, but <laughs> it's not a big deal. It's things like having a big array literal and it's all squashed under one line. So you, we can sort of live with that and fix it after the conversion, or maybe not, I don't know. I guess it's up to Walzer. <laughs> um, so the future of this, we need to fix some remaining performance problems. Uh, we fixed a lot of them already. The big one we're seeing, I think, is caused by moving from, instead of compiling DMD with GCC, compiling it with DMD instead, and the generated code just isn't as fast. So I also see that on Win32, the performance difference is much smaller because it's going from compiling with DMC to compiling with DMD, which is the same backend. Uh, a few minor things in the generated code still need to be cleaned up before we can actually switch over to that. We need GDC and LDC to catch up to 2.067 because with the performance hit coming from compiling with DMD, if we compile with GDC or LDC instead, that should not be a problem and we can do that for releases if they catch up and if they can compile it successfully. And well, once we're done with that, we can do a mass delete of the C++ code and switch over and we'll be done. <laughs> um, yeah, so after that, there's a whole bunch of things like the DMD glue layer can be ported to D as well with the same approach or it's small, probably small enough we could do it by hand if we had to. Uh, currently, the garbage collector is disabled because of mysterious seg faults, but <laughs> I think I know where they're coming from. It's coming from uh, some code using malloc to allocate an array that stores pointers to something, then it's the only reference is lost, so it frees it and seg faults. Uh, but that's, that's not too big a deal. Also, using the garbage collectors is going to be slower than the high speed custom allocator that's currently in the front end, but on the other hand, it won't use all of your memory and then crash. <laughs> so, well, I, I don't mind, but <laughs> it's less likely. Um, another thing we're sort of working on is removing all of the backend specific code from the front end. So, ideally, once we've done that, DMD, GDC, and LDC can use the exact same front end code, and that should massively reduce the effort needed to keep GDC and LDC up to date with DMD development. So in theory, we can get all our releases synced up, and that's sort of a long-term goal that a lot of people have wanted, right? Um, when we switch over, we're going to break pull requests, but you can fairly easily convert them over automatically. And it's just using a few Git tricks. You'd rebase up to the last C++ comment. You would automatically convert over using magic port. You'd then generate a new comment based on the diff against the, la the first D commit, and then you rebase that up to the top of master. So this can be done with a script, and in most cases, this won't cause any more problems than a normal rebase. Um, I, don't know, this is, I think I'm running out of time, but this is a vague timeline of the progress. So started around 2012, officially started when Andre made a thread about it in 2013. Uh, a month later, we had the first comet. By June, we had no link errors. So it didn't actually work, but no link errors. Um, all the compilable tests were working, which means basically just the front end and no interrupt with the glue layer. Uh, but by July 2013, the glue layer was working on Win32. We got Linux by the end of the year. By early 2014, we had all of the patches, both the, the things that wouldn't work in the, it, what, that couldn't be converted in the source and the, thi the bugs that actually pre prevented it from working properly were all in master. Um, later that year, we got the start of auto tester support. Early this year, it was all finished, everything went green. And in April, finally, the magic port and the manually ported stuff actually went into master. So right now, the auto tester is 
preventing anyone from breaking it. It is actually testing that it builds successfully with every single pull request. So yeah, this was over two years, nearly 400 pull requests, which is over 8% of the total <laughs> for DMD. <laughs> I mean, some of these were quite small, but it's 400 pull requests still. <laughs> and I'm, I'm hoping to apply this to other projects, so long as it's a small, consistent subset of C++. It doesn't have to be the same subset. So long as you can change the C++ source, it's not too bad. So long as there's not too much preprocessor, otherwise don't even, don't even try. And yeah, if anyone wants to do this, they've got some C++ project in mind they, they don't want to use anymore in C++. It does take quite a lot of debugging memory corruption and sort of debugging strange C++ interrupt stuff. But in the end, if your choice is between manually porting it, a big moving project, and automatic conversion, I, I, don't, I don't think there is a choice. I think it's, this is the best option. I'm, after doing it, I'm completely sold on it more than I was at the start. Okay, I, I guess a couple of minutes of questions. Um, you mentioned uh, the 20% perform performance difference. Uh, where is that? Is that in the, well, the code generated by DMD? Is GDC is better or? Well, yeah, so this is, uh, I think Martin did a few benchmarks on this. And so, the actual compiler itself runs about 20% slower than the one, the C++ version. And as far as I know, the problem is that DMD's code generation is not as good as GCC's code generation. But we haven't been able to test with GDC yet because GDC is not able to compile DMD yet because you actually need uh, 2.067 because there are a couple of last minute features in there and you need all the C++ mangling patches and all the interop stuff. So hopefully in the next couple of months that'll be done and LDC too. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? So are we on for 2068, the next release? When is that release going to happen? Uh, well, Martin is not here, but you know, I assume when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends on GDC and LDC, in my opinion. I don't think we can, I don't think we should even attempt to switch over until they're ready. And because I, I'm not sure we can actually match the C++ built DMD's performance in using DMD as the host. So hopefully in the next month, maybe, yeah. Okay, and um, um are we going to do anything about the pull requests that are going to be open at the time of the switcheroo? It's pretty easy to script automatic, automatic update of those. So some will break, but most of them already have the patches to the, the config file that allows them the new version of after the pull request to be converted automatically. Most, most don't actually need it. It's only if they add a global level function or introduce new types. And yeah, so as long as they're already working, the majority of them will be, with a simple script, they'll be able to be converted. All right. Thank you.